Ladies and gentlemen, may we welcome you to this second session of discussions that we have labeled, or that University Extension has labeled, Beyond the McCone Report. This one deals with education. And we are rather fortunate today in having with us an individual who did prepare some material for the McCone Commission and who will elaborate on that and give some of his other ideas in the course of his presentation. Following his presentation, two discussants will take the platform. We will introduce the discussants at that time. We will also trust that during the initial presentation, you will be stimulated to ask questions of the main speaker and of the discussants. We also hope that in this audience are some persons who may make significant contributions to this evening's get together. It is extremely important that we keep before us the problem that has come to be labeled nationwide and worldwide as the Watts Revolt. It is not a thing that was spawned overnight, nor is it a thing that will pass with the waving of a wand. Whenever we have the opportunity to have expertise on this matter brought to us, we certainly can profitably expose ourselves to it. This evening, the bearer of expertise is Dr. Martin, who has had a reasonably long career in education. He presently is a professor of special education at the California State College, Los Angeles. He has, however, served as a dean of instruction at that institution, and he has devoted a lot of his time to the study of the gifted child. Actually, at Stanford University, he did a dissertation for his doctor's degree and focused on the gifted child. More recently, however, he has turned his attention to the education of the disadvantaged and has served on state, local, and national committees and study groups concerned with that element of the American population. It gives me much pleasure to be able not to pull the time from him, but to give him to you for a maximum time. Dr. Martin. My uh, oldest daughter was busy this afternoon preparing a speech for a speech contest and uh, looked over my notes for tonight, wondered why there were no stories. She said, you can't give a speech without some stories for the audience. And I said, recent events in Los Angeles are such that, that any attempt at stories may be misinterpreted. Things have been rather grim, and, and most of the audience will be viewing events with some degree of, of uh, perhaps even lack of humor. And she said, all the more reason that uh, if you're going to have them get out of the immediate uh, problems and take a look with some objectivity at the important problems you're talking about in this paper, you'd better have them try to forget, for the moment at least, the immediate events in Los Angeles, so you'd better start with some kind of a story. And I said, but there's no story that would work tonight. And she said, yes, yes there is. Those stories you like to tell about children, because after all, the focus of what you have to say is on children. It was with this that I then jotted down a couple of notes of stories that I think are relevant, that I hope if you focus for a moment on children, it'll help you remove yourself for a moment from the context of Los Angeles. Some of you are familiar with Art Linkletter's television program. You've heard some of his interviews with children. 
and the wisdom as well as the humor that's involved. Adult humor, but in a sense, but wisdom as well from the children. There was a little girl on one of his programs who said when asked that she wanted to be a nurse. And he said, well, what's the first thing a nurse says to a patient when he walks into the office? The little make-believe nurse said, hello, lay down, relax. I'm going to give you a shot. <laughs> it was another little girl on his program who also thought she would be a nurse. And when he said, what's the most important thing to remember? She said, to smile and tell everybody to wait an hour. <laughs> Each of these stories does have relevance for the topic that I'm to present to you tonight. I've called it aspirin or surgery. Some of you may recall the comments of one critic of the McComb Commission, reported in the Los Angeles Times just after the report came out. He said, quote, we needed a recommendation for surgery, and they gave us aspirin. The author did not say he was referring specifically to the education section of the McCone report, but then he did not specifically exclude this section in his reference. So let's assume that he did mean it to apply. Aspirin ordinarily represents not a cure, but temporary relief from pain, a symptomatic and inexpensive treatment. Typically, surgery represents a fundamental, a drastic or radical, and much more costly attempt at cure. The question thus raised must be examined thoroughly because it is of vital importance that the painfully inadequate education of children in disadvantaged areas be treated radically and fundamentally toward a cure, not symptomatically for temporary relief. The question then becomes, are the major education <coughs> recommendations of the McCone Commission mild and aspirin-like or surgical and fundamental? It was another youngster who reported my dad is a doctor, an anesthetist. What's that, replied Linkletter. Oh, he's a man who puts people to sleep in hospitals. Then what? Then he hopes they wake up. <laughs> Prescribing the right remedy, a fundamental remedy, not just a palliative for the education of disadvantaged youth, is important for hope centers on education. To evaluate the usefulness of a remedy, we must first consider the victim and the disease. The disease is the vicious cycle of failure. Poor education, unstable family, poor job, poor housing, more welfare, more delinquency, more poor education. The victims are the poor. Many of these are Negro and many are Mexican-American, but not all of them. It is obvious that the disease requires a radical and immediate cure, not temporary relief. Why did the Governor's Commission on the Los Angeles riots believe that its recommendations in education were directed toward the roots of the problem, toward a cure? Why did they make these recommendations in education? Why did they feel that the approach they recommended gave, in fact, the greatest promise of providing a radical improvement in the education of disadvantaged youth? I am apparently in an unusual position in comparison with the rest of the consultants. I cannot complain that the Commission did not listen nor did not heed my advice nor my study, for they did. It would be easier to be able to agree with you that the Commission had great faults, but it would be dishonest if I did. And so I'd like to try to present to you the basis as well for the recommendations 
as well as the recommendations that were presented by the Commission in the area of education. An understanding of the Commission's recommendations in education requires an examination of the facts as viewed by the Commission. First, and there are nine of these which are fundamental, if they are wrong, then clearly the recommendations are at fault. But if they stand the test of being as true as truth can be today, then I think they support the recommendations. And the first of these facts is that the level of school achievement in the fundamental subjects of students in disadvantaged areas in Los Angeles as well as throughout the country is alarmingly low. To put it in another way, school achievement of students in disadvantaged areas is shockingly low, particularly in reading, writing, and language skills. From the standpoint of the Commission, this is a fact, an alarming and shocking fact, and as true in Los Angeles as it is throughout the country in the disadvantaged sections of large cities. Second, literacy, the ability to communicate and use reading, writing, and speaking skills is crucial to the development of intellectual, economic, and political freedom and effective participation in contemporary dynamic society of today. That it's crucial, not a nicety, not something that can be done without. A woman, one of the lecture series from a, an advantage section who was not of any minority extraction said to me, well, my boy isn't able to read, and we think we're able to make up for it in lots of other ways in, as he relates to people. It's very hard for me to convince such a woman with such a problem that her problem is more serious than she views it. But from my position as an educator, being illiterate, not being able to read and write, no matter what, does constitute an extremely serious and fundamental question so far as education is concerned. Third, so-called cultural deprivation, low IQ scores, or poor environment is no excuse and must not be the basis for accepting low achievement and illiteracy on the part of students in disadvantaged areas, even if school boards and educators throughout the country have been doing so for a long time. The corollary of this is that schools then must expect, require, demand, and provide the means for effective reading and writing achievement from students in disadvantaged areas. There is a closely related fact to this one, this third one, and that fact is that the most effective time, the most effective period at which to work to overcome the low achievement of such children is in the very earliest years. Fourth, that competent teachers, it is a fact, are leaving disadvantaged areas. That this is true increasingly in Los Angeles as well as in other large cities where it's far more advanced than it has been in the past in Los Angeles. That no forced system of assignment or system of extra pay shows any promise of success in overcoming this migration of able teachers to the middle class, advantaged, and suburban areas of large cities. The fifth fact, as viewed by the Commission, is that Los Angeles school personnel at the policy-making level are not consciously discriminating against disadvantaged groups or 
or minority groups. While schools in many large cities may in fact discriminate against students in disadvantaged areas, this is not so in the Los Angeles city schools in the normal definition of discrimination. This is not to say that there are no individuals within the system who discriminate on the basis of race, religion, color, or economic status. Nor does it say that there are not many forms of discrimination based on the low expectancy of achievement of students in disadvantaged areas. But conscious discrimination that assigns inferior teachers, textbooks, buildings, instructional equipment, and financial support to schools and areas on the basis that, quote, these parents don't care or don't count, or these students are of less value, or that these students can't learn anyway, or that this community won't protest, has been essentially overcome in the Los Angeles city system. Now, I will agree, in fact, uh, praise, that much of the reason for this has been the increasing voice in recent years of spokesmen from these areas. Probably no single person has served more as a conscience of the City Board of Education than Marnez Bataka. It may well be that this voice and voices being raised has a good deal to do with the fact that at least the conscious level of discrimination has been, if not eliminated, <laughs> essentially so in the Los Angeles city system at the policy-making level. Six, de facto segregation, as viewed by the commission, is harmful, particularly to Negro children. De facto segregation must be eliminated, and the schools contribute to it both directly and indirectly. The schools contribute to de facto segregation, segregation directly in perpetuating the neighborhood school concept that affect attendance boundaries and indirectly by participating in the cycle of low achievement, school dropouts, the resulting poor jobs, poor economic status, poor housing, poor neighborhoods, and continuing the cycle. Seventh, it's a fact, as viewed by the Commission, that so far, no practical, extensive, immediate solution for de facto segregation in large cities has been affected nor proposed that would overcome the intransigence of the white community. This is not to say that there are not examples of solutions in smaller communities or partial solutions that could be immediate that are helpful, but rather that no fundamental change in large cities appears to be immediately effective. Eight, there exists a practical and apparently effective means to correct low achievement in disadvantaged areas now. Although such means are enormously expensive, require massive changes in the organization of public schools, and in the outlook and policy of the school board as well, they are available, and we have evidence that they are effective. This possibility includes a, a concentration on the education of children in the earliest years, providing maximal opportunity for children to learn to read and write and participate successfully in the academic and intellectual curriculum of the schools, not some sidetrack. And C, to attract and hold the most competent and professionally dedicated teachers to teach in disadvantaged areas. And D, to reduce the school's contribution to de facto segregation and perhaps provide a beginning vehicle for breaking the spiral of failure and its contribution to de facto segregation. And the ninth fact, as viewed by the Commission, is that in Los Angeles an emergency exists. 
that correction of the cycle of failure must not be delayed. To wait for additional studies, trials, experimentation, or excuses must be affected now, now in all of the disadvantaged areas, no matter what the cost. No excuse, no wait, no experimentation, no waiting for additional studies, but affect the changes now. Not for a few of the children, but all of the children. I'd like to be able to point uh, to some facts that are sometimes overlooked. A very important fact that relates to these nine that is part of the documentation provided by the McCone Commission Education Report. If you'd flip on that machine for me, George, I'll present it. There is no question that effective education requires effective teachers. No gimmick, no remedial program, no compensatory education program is going to make it without the best teachers available in these areas. In every study in large cities of teacher personnel, one of two conclusions is consistent. The first one is that the best teachers leave the disadvantaged areas. All kinds of attempts at forced assignment have been tried. To my knowledge, none have been successful. For a long time, Los Angeles was able to avoid this problem by one means or another. By the time of the commission studies, the first ugly signs were apparent. This, if you can see it, the back you can move up if you can. This is the total years of experience of teachers in the five study areas within Los Angeles. If you are not familiar with the five study areas, there's a brief description in the education section of the report which is available to each of you and I. Oh, fine, that'll be easier. And total experience means from wherever they started teaching, whether it was in Los Angeles or elsewhere, as of the date of this study, how many years experience did all of the teachers have in these five areas? You'll recognize these areas. Avalon and Watts are in the uh, Negro area. Boyle Heights in East Los Angeles are essentially Mexican-American areas and some um, economically disadvantaged uh, uh, Caucasians. And the privileged area in this case is the area right near where we are today, the University Heights Westwood area. The, uh, there is another privileged area which is called Privilege Growth, and I'll show you. The, the thing we did not anticipate, I did not anticipate, is that the growth in this area had stopped very suddenly about three years ago. And as a matter of fact, there was a net loss of students in schools in this area, and it affected some of the later uh, figures. In order to be fair, we then also took the Granada Hills area, where it has uh, also been a uh, very, uh, very heavy growth area. There is about, if you look at these, running between 9 and 10 and 8, and these, there is about two years to two and a half years difference in total average experience in the privileged area as compared to the advantaged area of Los Angeles. This could be due to a number of different things. It could be due to consciously assigning experienced teachers when they come in to the more advantaged areas rather than the disadvantaged areas but our figures indicate that it was not due to that. Could you flip to the next one for me, please? You're going to have about four or five in a row. You might as well stand right there, George. We also examined the average years of experience in their present assignment. How long have these teachers been in the assignment to which they are now assigned? Those that were elementary, secondary, in Avalon, Boyle Heights, East Los Angeles, and Watts, appear to not be significantly different than those length of assignment in the advantaged area. It's about four and a half years, pretty close to it, 
throughout. You flip to the next one. So we examined experience as well within Los Angeles. Now this means it's bound to be less than their total experience because many of the teachers have had experience before they come here. Apparently, it is not the length of time in their present assignment that differs from our last chart. From this one, we can see that this is the heart of the difference. The difference between these figures and this, these figures and this, is very close to the difference between total years of experience in both areas. About two and a half, two and three quarters years. Essentially, what this means is that there is a migration of teachers, in fact, in Los Angeles, after they get tenure, toward the more advantaged areas. What information we have since the time of the study would indicate that this has been accelerating in recent years, that the movement of experienced teachers has been, in Los Angeles as elsewhere, from disadvantaged areas toward the advantaged areas. Would you flip to the next one? We also wanted some other comparisons on this very important question of teacher competence. And again, we found difference in every one of the figures that we looked at. And in most instances, it's also related to this question of experience and how long they stay in the area to which they've been assigned, rather than their initial assignment. This shows education level, and this is up secondary. And it shows clearly that the privileged area tends to have fewer with bachelor's degrees, more with master's and higher degrees. The reason for this is those that came without bachelor's, many of this is, part of it is doctorate, but very rarely, and this, this is doctorate. Most of this is due to those who have been in the district for a long time and came before the time they had to have a baccalaureate degree. They have a credential, a life credential. In this instance, however, it's clear to see that the movement is with more teachers with advanced degrees in the advantaged areas. Initial assignment, this is not true. But it is true if you take the teachers as they stand at this time within those districts. Flip to the next one, please. It's also true of employment status. That's what we get. Oh, this is the same thing at elementary. Similarly, you'll find not quite the difference, but still. Where there is a difference, the lowest for bachelor's degrees is here, and the highest for master's degrees is here. Could you flip to the next one, employment status, please? For employment status, <coughs> This would be, you know, there's some discussion here about is this really the best? And for all practical purposes, the teacher who has reached tenure, who has a regular credential, so far as employment status is a measure of teacher competence, and there are many other things that relate to it, but so far as this is an indication, it would indicate that the highest percentage here would be an advantage. That, as a matter of fact, this would be next because these are people with regular credentials, fully trained, that have just been in the district less than three years or less than four years. They're in first, second, or third year probationary status. Now these differ. This could be a person, and generally is, who qualifies for a credential but has not taken the Los Angeles City exams. Generally, this is a person who's been assigned very recently, say the February semester, and takes them in the fall. This is a person who does not have a regular credential and is hired on an emergency basis. This person could have a regular credential, but probably does not. If everything else were equal, and it rarely is, but insofar as statistics have and figures have any relationship, again, it would appear that the teachers who have been in the district the longest, who have reached permanent status, move toward the advantaged areas. So far as initial assignment is concerned, you could find no evidence that this was true. But it is true of the teachers that are actually there. Some places show substitute. Is this 
all element. This is elementary. It doesn't show as much here, but I should point out that it, in Watts, in both elementary and secondary, in contrast with the other disadvantaged areas, including Avalon, the figure on substitutes seemed abnormally high in contrast with everything else that shows a cost. That is, why would the district with this have this? And why would it be different than these? We read, or when we first got this, if you flip it to the secondary, I can show you the same thing. Raised the immediate question. Go ahead. Sam Hammerman said, it can't be true. It wouldn't happen that way. And he then took a look himself at the figures, got back an answer from personnel, and said, here's a list of the people that you've taken from the Watts area in the past six months to use as special reading teachers or special counselors or uh, supervisors and Head Start programs, etc., in order to be able to start your many special programs in the federal government. And it turned that in almost every instance, they were pulling these much more heavily from the Watts area than from other areas. And this, for the most part, made almost all the difference in substitute. It's particularly true the secondary level where they've increased the counselor ratio, and that a large proportion of these are in the special program. Nevertheless, none of that changes the essential difference, which is that in so far as employment status is a consideration, the disadvantaged areas are gradually getting more and more of the less of those teachers who have characteristics that are more closely related to less competence. It's not one to one. Incidentally, this is one place where we did use the privileged growth area, and it is closer, as you can see in each respect. Part of this is due to the fact that they have not had an increase, a proportionate increase in new teachers coming to the particular privileged area we picked. <coughs> Nevertheless, the difference, and this is true when we made all of the comparisons, there is a difference overall in the experience, education, and employment status of teachers <coughs> in the disadvantaged areas. <coughs> you can flip that off for now. This is a very important fact because it weighed very heavily with the commission and is something that must not be ignored in any attempt to make any immediate improvement in schools in disadvantaged areas. I've visited schools in large cities throughout the country, and there are many who thought they had the answer when they made forced assignment. And the answer always came out with more, less competent teachers in the disadvantaged areas. There is nothing that says that the teacher must stay with the city. She can move to the suburbs and increasingly it's a teacher's market, and forced assignment just doesn't do the job. The teachers themselves have reacted that extra pay, what uh, someone called hardship pay, doesn't attract the most competent teachers to disadvantaged areas either. There are some things that will. These facts then, not only these on teacher competence, but each of the others as viewed by the commission formed the the basis for the Commission's approach to recommendations in the areas of education. All such recommendations, it felt, had to show promise of major improvement in the level of achievement of students, had to attract and hold the most effective teachers in disadvantaged areas, and to successfully reduce the school contribution to de facto segregation. Finally, the Commission felt that above all, its recommendations had to be practical, massive, and immediate. It considered recommendations for additional studies and demonstration project, remedial gimmicks and exhortations to do good, to be inappropriate to the mood and need of the communities involved. Prior to the Commission report, Dr. Brookins who has been chairman of UCRC and an active leader in movements to improve schools in disadvantaged areas, was quoted in the Los Angeles Times, September 30th, 1965. He said to the commission, he was reported as telling the commission that he recommended, quote, more than just compensatory assistance in the field of education, unquote. What then are the criticisms of the education recommendations of the McCone Commission report. What are the alternatives? Apparently, the education section has received, by comparison, much less criticism and much more support. Those criticisms that have been made have been centered on three aspects, however. First, 
that the recommendations are not drastic or fundamental enough. Two, that the cost is too high. And three, that the recommendations in education support the position of providing separate but equal schools and help to perpetuate the status quo or de facto segregation. Let us examine each of these criticisms and then consider the alternatives. Are the recommendations drastic enough? An example of this type of criticism can be found in Robert Hutchins' column in the Los Angeles Times. He wrote, the McCone report was mild enough if all of its recommendations had been instantly carried out, they would have amounted to little more than a gesture of goodwill, an expression of intention to try and find out how to do something about jobs, education, and the police. Some critics cited the need for changes in teaching methods, not specifically described, and changes in curriculum, again, rarely described. Added to this group are those that wanted greater concentration on vocational training, remedial services, and increased efforts with dropouts. Incidentally, the education report does include the material from the Los Angeles City Schools and the programs that were already underway of this nature. Councilman John S. Gibson of the Los Angeles City Council listed a number of recommendations, which included, quote, establishing a trade school and the expansion of night school facilities, unquote. The difficulty with these approaches are not that they're wrong, but that they fit exactly the criticism raised by Dr. Brookings. They ameliorate the effects of the sickness, but they do not get at the major correction needed to eliminate the disease. The Job Corps, the remedial programs at high school level, group therapy, counseling centers already underway in the city of Los Angeles are excellent examples to show that such provisions may buy time, they may ameliorate the after effects of poor education, but they don't solve the cycle of failure that results in second generation of children involved in the failure. Clearly, in this sense, getting at the basic root cause of the disease the lack of an ability to communicate and participate in economic, cultural, social, and civic life of the community is directly related to the attainment of basic communication skills, reading, writing as well, and the use of these tools for lifelong education. Certainly Robert Hutchins would agree that direct teaching of job skills and remedial teaching for dropouts are the patch-up, temporary, aspirin-like treatment if we wait until the student is already an extremely low achiever in junior high or high school or a dropout, we will have missed the opportunity to provide a basic change to give the youngster the flexibility, the intellectual and educational flexibility and skill that is required in the demands of the dynamic economic and cultural life of today. The best vocational skill the schools can successfully teach are the fundamental intellectual skills of language, including reading, writing, and arithmetic, and speaking. With these tools, the student can profit from the same high school comprehensive curriculum that's afforded all students. Without these tools, these fundamental tools, the student is sentenced to an intellectual ghetto for life. The McCone Commission approach with its concentration on the early years and on the improvement of the total quality of the school's efforts gets at this fundamental need. No critic so far has proposed an alternative that in this sense would be more basic and fundamental than the recommendations of the McCone Commission. The Commission recognized the drastic nature of its recommendations when it stated, quote, we propose that the programs for schools in disadvantaged areas be vastly reorganized and strengthened so as to strike at the heart of low achievement and break the cycle of failure. We advocate a new, massive, expensive, and frankly experimental onslaught on the problem of literacy, and we propose that it be attacked at the time and place where there is now an exciting prospect of success." End quote, page 58. This leads to the second criticism of the McCone Commission. 
That is that the cost is too high. Could you flip that one on for me? The estimates of cost, not by the city board, but by the legislative analyst of the state of California, on January 14, 1966, indicate that the total statewide cost to implement the McCone recommendations for disadvantaged children is $344 million, including $181 million for capital outlay. Show me Los Angeles first, would you? For Los Angeles, $260 million, $155 million of a capital outlay would mean for all children not only in the disadvantaged areas, but in areas where there is low fundamental achievement, but the recommendations could be initiated. Keep in mind, this is a one-time cost for capital outlay. To those who say the expense is too great, consider the other uses we're making of money, both within the county, the city, the state as well as nationally and internationally today. Would you flip to the statewide cost, please? The statewide cost, if the program were done statewide, has some other benefits in addition to the benefits for the children involved and the adults there to be. And that is that the resources of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act and of the Economic Opportunity Act and the McAteer Bill and the UNRWA Reading Specialist Bill and the bill that's now been passed by both the Assembly and the Senate to provide a reduction in class size, if combined with these, would reduce the overall cost considerably. Beyond the $181 million, of which the present bond issue would provide $35 million immediately, the costs are much less than the difference shown here. Because they are reduced, by the Elementary and Secondary Education Act money if this is put into this kind of program. Approximately $189 million, including capital outlay costs, over and above the money already afforded by federal, state, uh, and state, federal and state money could provide for the education recommendations of the McCone Commission statewide. To those who say the cost is too high, we must admit that it is expensive, particularly when provided for not only all disadvantaged children, but those of low academic achievement throughout. But in the words of the commission, quote, it is clear that the proposed programs will be costly, but not as costly as the failure, delinquency, loss of productive manpower and social dependency as the result of the alternatives. Could you flip that off for me, please? The third area of criticism is that the recommendations of the commission support the position of providing separate but equal schools and therefore perpetuate the status quo and de facto segregation. The commission stated, quote, it is our belief that raising the level of scholastic achievement will lessen the trends toward de facto segregation in the schools in the areas into which the Negroes are expanding and indeed will tend to reduce all de facto segregation. It is our conclusion that the very low level of scholastic achievement we observe in the predominantly Negro schools contributes to de facto segregation in those schools. In turn, school segregation apparently contributes importantly to all de facto segregation. We reason, therefore, and I'm still quoting, that raising the scholastic achievement might reverse the entire trend of de facto segregation. Page 60, unquote. The commission's own statement makes it clear that it was not their intent to support or condone de facto segregation, but rather to reduce and eliminate it. They do believe, however, that reduction and elimination of de facto segregation in the schools cannot be separated from the problem of improvement in the quality of the schools. Nevertheless, I agree. I believe the members of the commission would agree that the movement to implement 
the Macomb Commission recommendations would be strengthened if their intent to eliminate the school's contribution to de facto segregation in conjunction with the drastic reorganization and the quality of schools in the disadvantaged areas was made clear to all. Such a move would increase the support of civil rights groups and provide even more united support from the public and the teaching profession to get these important, needed changes in the complete reorganization of the quality of schools in disadvantaged areas. The alternatives to the recommendations of the McCone Commission that are most often mentioned include busing or redistricting to break up de facto segregation, the development of educational parks that would increase flexibility and grouping of children and increase the possible success of redistricting to reduce de facto segregation, and programs like the St. Louis Benneker District program to increase motivation of students. Let me be clear. Busing of students is not educationally disastrous. I agree that we bus children all of the time. There is nothing wrong with small children or large children being bused. But busing of students has never been sufficiently acceptable to the white community to allow a really thorough desegregation. And to the extent that it has been tried in every major city, it contributes to the exodus from the city to the suburbs or to private schools of the whites. And the result is more segregation. This is not to say that there's anything wrong with busing. And so far as it is obtainable, it should be obtained. Incidentally, it was Mrs. Tackett who pointed to the empty classrooms to the commission in her testimony, and it was the commission's recommendation that at least the empty classrooms ought to be examined in relation to their location to see if we couldn't take some of the double session students from disadvantaged areas and get them into these empty classrooms. The study was made, and lo and behold, for $180,000, those empty classrooms could be utilized and children taken off double sessions. And you know what decision was made on even that very small, really token of desegregation resulted in. The great victory of the Ambler school districting, redistricting, really is a temporary change. As important as it is in the sense of indicating an attitude on the part of the school board, its contribution to the central problem is minor. Five years ago, when that school was planned, it would have been a desegregated school. If the boundaries had stayed the same, it would have been a segregated school. By this recent action, the board allows about a 25, 75% mixture toward desegregation. Within five years, the odds are it'll be segregated again. It is not an approach to the heart of the problem, but there, let me make this clear, there's nothing wrong with it educationally. The educational parks proposal, which is another, which gets at the problem particularly of de facto segregation, may not be known to everyone. Let me explain what it is. Instead of a single school in one block and several blocks away another school, you take a large number of acres, maybe as many as 500 or even 1,000 acres, and you put more than 15,000 children on this one site in a park-like atmosphere with many schools, the individual schools not being over 1,000 in size. Particularly, you do it with middle schools. You take the middle school level, five, six, seven, and eight, and group these schools here, and you bring children from all over the city to these park areas. The superintendent of schools in New York first reported this as a possibility in a report, interim report dated December 3, 1963. A special later report called the Allen Report from the New York State Commission on Education Advisory Committee on Human Relations and Community Tensions that was issued on May 12, 1964, <clears throat> said, we recommend further that as soon as possible the middle schools should be located in educational parks so as to provide children in as many parts of the city as feasible the experience of attending a genuinely integrated school during their middle school years. i give you more details on this, but let me tell you that it is feasible. It could be worked. 
It has many advantages. It would be particularly effective if it was related to a fundamental change in the quality of schools as well for these students, but it has a major defect. And that defect is that getting that kind of acreage in the areas where you need it, getting that kind of condemnation and getting those buildings built and getting the bond issues that it takes to replace buildings that exist with these takes a minimum of five to 10 years. They are still not even essentially started in New York and that's now four years since the first of the idea, three years since it was first announced. Admittedly, after the first one developed, was developed, the others would take much less time. Certainly it should be carefully studied in Los Angeles. Certainly it has much to offer for the long range Apart from any other disadvantage, its major disadvantage right now is it won't give us the help we need now. And what we're proposing, what the Commission has proposed, is not inconsistent with some ultimate division and development of such parks. A third alternative that's proposed, or kind of alternative, is the St. Louis District Benneker proposal. And in many respects, this is excellent. One area of St. Louis called the Benneker District is under the direction of an extremely able assistant superintendent, Samuel Shepard. The essence of the St. Louis project is, first of all, that you don't accept the low achievement of children in these areas as being inevitable. And keep in mind, St. Louis Benneker District is not completely a ghetto. It is already, it is still, I should say, uh, about 60% uh, Negro and about 40% Caucasian. Nevertheless, the major aspect of this program, as described by Sam Shepard himself, is that you constantly urge the teachers to get in there and teach and to not accept low achievement, that you get to parents and you urge them not to accept the low achievement on the part of their children and to work on them and make them do their homework, and that you work on the schools <clears throat> not to accept anything that's sloppy in the way of schoolwork from children. One principal from a school in a disadvantaged area here in Los Angeles reported in a conference recently that he has just such a project going on in his school. He calls it TLH. It's called Teach Like Hell. Neither he nor the St. Louis Project, however, have reported how successful they are in overcoming the problem of attracting and getting competent and experienced teachers migrating to disadvantage, from disadvantage to advantaged area. Certainly, motivation and higher expectations are important. And this is a kind of prejudice that does exist in many teachers. But urging teachers and pupils and parents to do better day in and day out, year in and year out, has been the approach of superintendents and school boards and many others for years when they didn't want to spend money in education. It takes more than that. While it may affect the conscience of many, it has over the years appeared to have little effect on overcoming the low achievement of most students in disadvantaged areas. I do agree that it has economic advantages on the part of taxpayers and I do agree that it is heartily endorsed by many rightist groups, particularly those attempting to foster upon us the so-called Edmonston Plan. But the so-called Edmonston Plan schools in Washington, D.C., reports of educational achievement are a fraud. When you pick those children who have IQs averaging 109 and report only their achievement test scores, every major city in the country in their disadvantaged areas will look like the kids are all achieving up to level. Further, when you take and compare for your expectancy criteria, Otis IQ test scores with their heavily verbal weight and say that on the basis of their IQ test scores, we have made a level of expectancy and the children throughout the disadvantaged area meet this level of expectancy, that's a fraud. Every major city can do this. This is exactly what superintendents have been doing for years, using the inadequate for these areas verbal IQ tests as an excuse for accepting the low achievement by saying they're achieving up to expectancy. It's the wrong expectancy. 
While each of the alternatives and many of the criticisms to the McCone Commission recommendations in education do have a contribution to make in the sense that they may focus attention on some particular aspect of the problem, none to date comes as close to meeting the fundamental needs in disadvantaged areas as do the Commission's recommendations. It's true that in many respects the Commission's recommendations parallel the approach of the More Effective Schools program in New York in many respects. It is also true that the More Effective Schools program, while intensive and expensive, is only now in its second year and therefore has not proven itself. All of the signs, however, up to this point, point, indicate an exciting possibility of success. In some instances, the recommendations of the Commission on Education, though clearly stated, have been misunderstood by those who have not read them carefully. Keep in mind the criteria that we have presented originally and then examine those recommendations in comparison to the alternatives. One, these were the facts. The school achievement of students in disadvantaged areas is shockingly low, particularly in reading and language skills. Remember. Two, literacy. As viewed by the Commission, the ability to communicate and use reading and writing skills is crucial to the development of intellectual, economic, and political freedom and active participation in our contemporary dynamic society. I say this because those who, who would shun this off as not as important as other goals, I think, mistake an important role for the schools. Three, that so-called cultural deprivation, low IQ scores or poor environment is no excuse and must not be the basis for accepting low achievement or illiteracy on the part of students in disadvantaged areas. Four, competent teachers are leaving disadvantaged areas. Five, Los Angeles school personnel at the policy-making level are not consciously discriminating against disadvantaged students or Negroes. Six, de facto segregation is harmful, particularly to Negro children. De facto segregation must be eliminated and the school's contribution to it both directly and indirectly. Seven, so far, no practical, extensive, immediate solution for de facto segregation in large cities has been affected nor proposed that would overcome the intransigence of the white community. Eight, there exists a practical and apparently effective means to correct low achievement in disadvantaged areas now. Nine, in Los Angeles, an emergency exists and correction of the cycle of failure must not be delayed. Keeping these in mind, examine, if you will, the recommendations of the Commission. First, quote, school services in disadvantaged areas must be expended, extended down to the ages of three and four in order to give these children the background and reinforcements, particularly in language skills, that they have not received in their informal education prior to school. These programs for disadvantaged three and four-year-old children must be provided throughout the regular school year and they must be permanently maintained. Classes must be more than child care or babysitting services. They must be carefully programmed to provide the background these children need to develop verbal and language abilities. The second recommendation of the Cone Commission is class size must be significantly reduced for children now in elementary and junior high schools in disadvantaged areas in order to maximize the opportunity for effective teaching. Class size in these schools should be reduced to a maximum of 22. A less drastic reduction from the present average class size of 33 would still be expensive but would offer much less promise of success. The second McCone Commission recommendation parallels the more effective schools requirement that class size will vary from 15 in pre-kindergarten classes to a maximum of 22 in other grades. The third major education recommendation of McCone Commission reads, quote, additional personnel to cope with disturbed and retarded children and special problems of disadvantaged child to be made available in, in these schools. The energies and services of the teacher can be dissipated if instead of teaching, uh, instead of teaching is mine, if she has to work with a myriad of special problems that are much greater in number and extent than they are in more advantaged areas. To be effective, the teacher in disadvantaged areas does need more immediately available help 
with guidance, welfare, health, and social and emotional problems than do teachers in advantaged areas. Quoting from page 59. The commission recommendations parallel the more effective schools requirement. If you'd like to see a more detailed analysis of that program, there is a copy in the back of the education study for the commission, and you can get it by writing to the more effective schools program in New York. The commission recommendation, as it was viewed by the commission, showed its hope for the effect these would have on the teacher assignment problem. They quoted, I'm quoting from the commission again, a sharp reduction in class size together with provision for special supporting services and materials would offer teachers a more professionally rewarding assignment and would likely attract dedicated teachers to seek positions in disadvantaged areas. The commission study, as well as experience elsewhere, supports this conclusion. If we can provide the most effective possible learning situation for the student, attract able teachers to teach in these areas, we will have made the most important step toward solving the problem of low educational achievement. What's needed is a willingness to try them here in Los Angeles. Educators and others need to unite to make the highest quality approach to education of all children available. Now, this is the radical remedy that's needed. One last incident I think that will add to my conclusion in this sense. It comes again from the medical profession. A patient came into a dermatologist with scaled, marked, sore hands, was examined carefully with special tissue cultures taken and x-rays and ointments used. And following the careful examination, the doctor turned to the patient and said, have you had this trouble before? Yes, replied the patient. Well, said the doctor, you've got it again. This must not happen here. <coughs> Superficial remedies are not enough. The McComb Commission concentrated quality approach to education is the immediate action that's needed for the school disease in our cities. Roy Wilkins, in his April 18, 1966 column in the Los Angeles Times, gave good advice when he wrote, quote, the main areas of civil rights struggles in the next years will be in education, employment, and housing. Schools, he said, are basic, and school men, more so than others, should adopt the revolutionary attitude recommended in the McCone Report." Unquote. This is surgery not aspirin. We've certainly had a very stimulating presentation. jokes about um, children, I'm reminded of that uh, miniature adult who used to sound off on radio and then on television calling for, and I'm calling for Mr. Gordon Tree if he happens to have come into the auditorium. It's Mr. Go calling Mr. Gordon Tree. Calling Gordon Tree. Call for Gordon Tree. <laughs> Apparently he is not here. Um, tonight we were to have two discussants, as I indicated earlier. 
uh, Mr. Gordon Trigg of the Los Angeles City Schools Department of Urban Affairs was to be one of these. He called a bit earlier saying that he was en route here from Fort Ord and hoped to be here before Kenneth Martin got through with his presentation. I have a feeling that perhaps he got tied up in traffic and may still appear before us. The other discussant for the evening is, of course, the well-known Mrs. Manez Batakit, who serves as chairman of the URC, uh, UCRC Education Committee. She has been unceasing and tireless in her work. It gives me great pleasure to ask her to come to the platform and begin her conversation in her own way. You gave me the opportunity to sit down. Of course, my feet won't touch the floor if I sit down, but I couldn't see over that desk if I stood <laughs> up. So this is the lesser of the two evils. I um, am wondering why Mr. Trigg isn't here no, or so why he didn't call somebody from our school board and tell them to get down here in a hurry so that they could defend themselves. I'm glad, uh, Dr. Martin, that you started out with the schools by talking about children, because from some of the things I've been seeing and hearing, I had begun to wonder whether schools were still for children. So I'm happy that you uh, started out with jokes and talk about children. I, uh, before I begin to point out maybe one or two things that you said with which we might disagree, I want you to know that I am personally going to nominate you for the next superintendent of the Los Angeles City Schools. <laughs> you really did not give me much with which I could honestly disagree. <laughs> And truly, the United Civil Rights Committee, or Council as we are now called, was not set up for the purpose of disagreeing. We really were set up to find areas on which we could agree. And when we had our first confrontation with the so-called power structure, we opened up by saying to men of good will. And so we assume that you people who are here tonight, those to whom we talk to, although you know it isn't always that way, at the Board of Education, at the state level, and at the national level, we presume to be men of good will and who are honestly seeking to overcome some of the problems that have been caused by segregation. And so I would say to you, in disagreeing with you on the first point, that the disease is really not poverty. It is not poor housing. It is not a limitation because of jobs. But the disease is really segregation. And out of segregation, discrimination. For if we had not had the discrimination that we have had against people of color and against people of, who speak another language, such as our Mexican-American friends, I'm sure that we would not have, to the extent that we do have, the concentrated poor housing, the ghetto, the poverty, or the lack of employment. So that I would first say that before we have any real correction, the surgery that is needed is the elimination of segregation and discrimination in all of its forms. The children who are not achieving are really not achieving because 
they are unable to achieve. They are not achieving because they have not been given the chance, the real chance to achieve. There are a very few, as history will tell you, by people like Ralph Bunch, Marian Anderson, Paul Robeson, Jackie Robinson, and many others, scientists, engineers, teachers, our own Dr. Jones who sits next to me, Dr. House whom I see out in the audience, and many others who have proven beyond the shadow of a doubt that God, when he dished out mental ability, did not dish it out according to race, our color, our place of national origin. We will find, if we go into our schools of the mentally retarded in special education, that children there are of all the colors that God made men. Therefore, if every child is given an equal chance to achieve, given an equal opportunity, and what do we mean when we say an equal opportunity in education? It simply means what Thurgood Marshall said some years ago in talking about education in the United States. It means the same education in the same place at the same time so that if all children were given the same exposure, you would find that they would achieve just like we achieve in everything else, pretty much on the old bell curve system that you have forgotten about now, but where you had a few people <laughs> who excelled, who were gifted, who were exceptional, who maybe worked a little harder than others. And then you had a large group called the average. Then you would have a group that was not achieving. Now, when you say average, most of us fall into the average group. I had an insurance uh, general agent who once said, you should never try to be average because the average simply means that you are the worst of the best and the best of the lousy. So, <laughs> but this is where most of us are. We're in that great average group, just a little better than the lousy. And this is where most of your Negro children would be. Most of your Mexican-Americans would be there, and believe it or not, most of your white Anglo-Saxon Protestants would be there. And I see a couple of Catholic sisters, and most of your Catholics, too, would be there. And if there are any Jewish people in the audience, believe you me, you would be there, too, in this great average group. So that I say to you, Yes, we need all of these things. But I said to the Board of Education when they were making their recommendations for funds under the Federal Education Act, all you have here is compensatory education, compensation, which simply means that six years from now, we'll be standing right here before you screaming for more compensation for the harm you have done the children who are coming on. So we don't need compensation. What we need is good education the first time around. Then there will be a few, yes, who have to have special attention but we will be able then to give that special attention not on the basis of race, not on the basis of color, but simply on the basis of humanity. People will then cease to be poor achievers because of the color of their skin. They will then become poor achievers because they're human. 
They will not become great achievers because of the color of their skin. They will be great achievers because they are human. And they'll be just as my daughter put down when she was making an application for a college. They put down race. And she brought the paper to me and she says, Mother, they have race down here. What do you think I should put down? I said, what do you think you should put down? She says, well, this is what I have put down, human. And they accepted her in that school. Now, now this is what we are. We're all of the human race. And the fact that I didn't have as nice a TV or the fact that I didn't get to go to, zo to the zoo as many times as some other child are the fact that my mother didn't read as many newspapers as some other child's mother will not affect my ability to learn if somebody takes the time to expose me and to teach me how. And I think the day has come when we need to quit teaching children to read, but we need to teach them how to read. Because if you tell me how to do it, then I don't need you to teach me to do it. And this is what we need. Yes, we have much to overcome because there have been many faults. Now, again, I must say that I don't share with you that all of the discrimination and all of the placement of teachers and all of the, let's see, you had it under a certain point here, and I want to say it kind of the way that you said it, that uh, there has been no conscious discrimina discrimination. I just want to say that I do not agree that all of the discrimination, all of the drawing of lines to contain race that has happened through the years here in Los Angeles has all been done unconsciously. I declare this would certainly be an unconscious board and staff of, uh, here in Los Angeles if it was all done unconsciously. <laughs> there has been in all of our economy a definite effort to keep the Negro in his so-called place and not only keeping him in his so-called place, but to keep him from becoming an economic threat to other people. If we have the same education, if we are able to achieve just like everybody else, then we're able to hold jobs, and it would be impossible now for so many of our industrial leaders to come back and say in great innocence and seeming confusion, I would hire Negroes, but I can't find anybody who is qualified. Now, if we qualify everybody, then we can get jobs for these people. They can take these jobs, and when they get these jobs, they become a threat, we feel, to others. But we live in a world of plenty. We have plenty of money. We have billions of dollars to spend in getting to the moon. I don't know what we will do when we get there, but we have a lot of money to spend for that. We have a lot of money to spend for conquering Vietnam. I don't know what we will have conquered when we get through with Vietnam. But at any rate, we have millions of dollars to spend for that. We have know-how for anything that we want to do. Man is wonderfully made. He has a brilliant mind that God has given him. And it seems strange to me that we can conquer space. We can take a man out. We can bring him back through the atmosphere. We can do all kinds of things. He can even walk out there in space now. 
get back into the capsule. They can shoot these capsules off, get the two of them together. And yet, right here in Los Angeles, somehow we can't get the two races of people or the two groups of people together in education. This can be done. We have the brain power. We have the know-how to do it. And I say to you, yes, we do need the things that you have recommended, but we need more than we need anything else, the elimination of segregation in schools. We need the elimination of discrimination against groups of people. It would be much harder to discriminate against the groups if the groups were all in school together. So UCRC will continue, as you have said, to be the conscience, we hope, of Los Angeles until that day will come, the day that we dream of, when all men will be treated according to our Constitution as equals. I was afraid I was taking too much time and I didn't want to name various ways that we could uh, achieve segregation. For instance, uh, desegregation. Uh, deseg <laughs> we have achieved segregation. Thank you. <laughs> various ways that we could achieve desegregation. Uh, there are uh, many plans. Of course, Los Angeles plans would have to be studied by experts who have all of the facts, the time, and the money with which to uh, work the plan out. But just to give you an example of a few, let's take busing. We could easily bus children to schools that are under-enrolled right now to achieve a degree of integration. We could group schools around the periphery of the concentration of Negro population so that we might use plans like the Princeton plan, or we might use um, a uh, uh, 444 plan that would send these children to the same school. Now this would uh, call for perhaps some transportation, but very little uh, transportation. Uh, we could have magnet schools, such as you have talked about. We might have demonstration schools that um, uh, would be so specialized that people would be glad to bring their children, say, from Bel Air 
clear across town or to have them go to get the advantages that they would have even in these elementary schools. So uh, then there are the educational parks and um, many uh, things, uh, including an exchange program where we have such a large area we could exchange students for a semester or a year. And children say, let's suppose we decided to do this at the fifth grade. The children could be prepared by textbooks, you see, that would give the contributions of all people and would let them see a little uh, Negro boy and a little white boy playing together. There should be uh, human relations uh, uh, workshops for parents getting them ready, say, for the fifth grade, for this great exchange, when a half of the fifth grade from this school would go to a, a, another school, and a half of that fifth grade would come over to this school, could be an exchange program, say, for a year, that the children could look forward to, the parents could look forward to, and it would give a type of integration even where uh, the um, problem of housing or segregated housing would make it just almost impossible. You see, in the McCone uh, Commission uh, report, there is a suggestion that those who are sinned against offer the cure rather than the sinner, you know, being converted because the, uh, they state that if we had this greater achievement, then we might achieve segregation. Well, this is, I mean, integration. Uh, we are just, uh, uh, we are going at it, really backwards, putting the cart uh, before the horse. And the young lady he, who, were oh, you to, he was going to finish. No um, let me include, I'll go through these and answer yours at the same time. <clears throat> First of all, the busing is, is an important question. And I'd like to point out that it is possible in some communities. It is possible in some communities, and I, uh, I know of some communities in the Los Angeles County, which for other minority groups have, through busing, several years ago, without any incident, any problem, solved the problem entirely by busing. Um, if I, if I call your attention to it, it'll probably call attention to the people who've been living with it for 10 years with no problems at all, so I'm not going to bother. <laughs> but it is true. It can be solved this way in small communities particularly, and has been done completely, by taking the proportion of the minority group of the total population and essentially within, within a range, having that proportion in all of the schools in that area. So the answer is it can be done. Second, busing can be done certainly to the extent of the recent recommendation to the Board of Education. You may know the history of this, that at the time that uh, Marnesba, and someone came with you, uh, you, you, was you wrote it essentially, gave an affidavit or a, a testimony to the McCone Commission. She oh, called yes. attention to the He's fact massive. that though her, her material was not up to date, she did know that there were a large number of empty classrooms that could be used that were reasonably near the areas where there were double sessions. Now we asked then for an inventory from within the school district of where are the double sessions and where are the empty classrooms? It was very complicated. There was no way of seeing an introspection the time we had how you could get these two together. And they told us of the reasons that some were being used for libraries and some were being used in the process for, for the next semester. Tables for teachers. Uh, well, no, no, they didn't tell us that. <laughs> but the, it was difficult. So one of the recommendations of the commission was that those empty classrooms and the double sessions be studied to see if there wasn't a possibility to do some elimination immediately. And so the board did allow a study. I think it was donated by Rand Corporation. I'm not sure who. And they did come up, after carefully checking it out, that yes, a large number of empty classrooms could be utilized and some busing could be provided. The total cost $180,000 for what, 1,500 students? Yes. For 1,500 students, 1,500 students, to be able to get off of double session, use existing classrooms with not too much travel time, it would all work out very well. Fortunately, the board turned even that much down. Now, so the answer is it's possible, and I should point out that Marnesba or anyone else that's proposed busing 
has said flatly that the only answer to desegregation is to bus all of the kids in Los Angeles from all over to achieve exactly 14% or whatever the, the percentage is in all of the schools of the Negro group and 20% of the Mexican-American group, etc. No one has proposed this. And, uh, and to my knowledge, I've never heard of Marnesba. So those who use that have constructed a straw man. That it can be used in limited circumstances to begin getting a breakthrough, no one can deny. And there's nothing wrong, as Marnesba says, with a little yellow school bus. Now the second one is the one on grouping around the perimeter of disadvantaged areas. Now this does have some advantages, particularly in small communities, and the Princeton plan works very well. The major difficulty in large cities is, just like the Ambler situation, you do the grouping, and people of goodwill say, we're going to keep it a desegregated school. But pretty soon, one pressure after another from the outside, and that school becomes resegregated again, unless you do something else. And this is related to what Marnesba has called the demonstration school, and it is directly related to the McCone Commission recommendations, and that is, that if, as in the New York More Effective Schools Program, you make these schools, particularly those that are already in the process of being desegregated, the best schools in the city, and then some of the same things that have happened in New York will happen. Let me tell you, at the end of the first year, of the first 10 schools, five were, in fact, specifically chosen because they had already in the process, if not uh, desegregated. And they had a new problem. First of all, at the end of that year, there was no increase in segregation in those schools in four of the five. And in the fifth, there was a 10% increase in the non-minority population. Now, that's only one year, and that's not significant. It is significant that it did at least not become more segregated. More importantly, I had a direct correspondence with a man who's a community worker in the area of one of the more effective schools. And I asked, because he visits parents, can you give me some informal evaluation? He said, yes, we have a problem. Parents are lying about where they live so they can be in this school. If we have this kind of an approach to those peripheral schools as well, we do have a possibility. It isn't going to solve the problem, believe me. It isn't going to be the final answer by any means on desegregation, but it will make a contribution. So this one is also possible, whether we call it model school, demonstration school, or more effective school, particularly if we place them in this area. And this is what the commission had in mind when they said you could make a contribution toward lessening the school's contribution toward de facto segregation, but no one considers it the final answer. The other one is the question of specialties in schools. That is, this works particularly well at the high school level, where you have a school that offers, let's say, foreign languages beyond the level that other schools do, or one that offers special work in, let's say, the social sciences that others do not, and an open enrollment plan where students can come any place in the city and get there. Now, the disadvantage of this is it doesn't work unless you also provide transportation. And one of the things the commission did find, it's buried in there, no one paid much attention to it except the administrative uh, the legislative analyst who looked at the costs involved, is that we said, look, here are schools like Jordan and Jefferson. They have gifted students. They don't have the same curriculum, even though theoretically they have it. They don't have the same curriculum opportunities as students in other schools. Some of the advanced sections of classes either are not available because there aren't enough such students ready for them, or there are not enough such sections to fit into their program. If they lived in advantaged areas, as so often happens, mother and father have transportation and could take them to the school that does have it, which is a rule in Los Angeles. If one school offers a class that a student needs and it isn't offered in his school, he can enroll for that class in the other school. But he's got to provide his own transportation. So the commission said, provide the transportation for students in disadvantaged areas to take advantage of this. So that this is possible, is possible right now, and incidentally is happening now in Los Angeles. Not as much as we'd like to see, because there's not that much specialization, but it is happening. The disadvantage of relying entirely on this, however, is that two-thirds of the kids in disadvantaged areas drop out before they get to 12th grade, before they complete high school. So that it's a good addition. It's a nicety. And more than that, it's an important addition. But it doesn't get at the fundamental problem. It isn't the vast reorganization that we need. But it is a good addition. The other one is the exchange program. And this can be done by grades. It can also be done for special programs, like having a, a district 
musical organization that transcends the particular neighborhood area. You have to bust them anyway, so mix them at this level. The kids that are interested in music have the mixed orchestras. Uh, the same way with a number of different kinds of school-sponsored cultural and other events. This can be done, even moving them for a whole year, you know, exchange classes for a whole year. This can be done. <coughs> However, if it's done by a whole class, it's still possible. But it doesn't help the youngster who isn't reading going into the fifth grade at 111th Street School, go, if he moves with his teacher and his same class to a school that's all white, he isn't any more likely to be able to read as a result. Now, there's some other benefits. There are benefits that can involve the long-range development of human relations problems that need to be solved and acquaintanceship that we need to get. But it doesn't get at this fundamental problem. It's a good addition. And wherever you can get around the intransigence of whites to allow it, or of other minority groups, etc., it would be great. And wherever it can be, and it is acceptable to the group involved, or at least uh, there's no great objection, not acceptable, it should be tried. But it doesn't get at the fundamental problem. You still have kids dropping out. You still have kids unprepared to meet today's needs if they can't handle this more basic problem. May I so, make... Oh, pardon me. Yeah. So what I'm saying is each of these things is possible. They are all good additions. They're even better if they're based on a foundation that makes a radical reorganization at the early years for these children. And every attempt at desegregation must also be tried. But we mustn't wait until this happens before we get at this other problem. We just can't wait. Uh, may I make just a statement here that we have never advocated that a whole classroom be moved with a teacher which, so that you would have a segregated classroom in a new school. And then I would like to say this, that uh, from the experiences of the Transport a Child program, the voluntary busing program, uh, these are children taken throughout, from, uh, throughout the city, some of them coming from the actual geographical area of Watts whose parents can pay for their transportation or partially pay for their transportation. And uh, these, uh, and some of the parents are doing this at a great sacrifice, but one mother said to me the other day that her son came home for the first time after being bused a semester actually anxious